Hey everyone, Adam Simmons here from DGTL Infra, short for Digital Infrastructure. Billionaires Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are truly showing their ambitions for space, with Starlink and Project Kuiper each investing over $10 billion. In part one of this two-part series, I'm going to give you an overview of Starlink, detail on other providers like Amazon who are building a satellite-based broadband service, and the key characteristics of Geo, Mio, and Leo satellites. You will gain a better understanding about some of the fundamental shifts enabling satellite-based broadband to be deployed worldwide. So stay tuned, and I will break this all down for you. Before I do, be sure to subscribe to the DGTL Infra channel and turn on the notifications so you don't miss my next in-depth video that is coming out soon. Now, let's jump into the video. So satellites are an important part of the wireless ecosystem. They connect everything you see in this video, from providing broadband on airplanes to providing broadband to your home. Satellite connectivity is particularly important for rural and remote communities, which are not supplied by other traditional forms of connectivity. As you can see from the bottom of the video, there are three examples of ways in which people typically receive a broadband connection for internet access to their home or business. The yellow line signifies copper that is used for phone and DSL, or digital subscriber line, connectivity, which transmits digital data over telephone lines. This is the slowest form of wireline connectivity, but it covers both urban and rural areas. The red line you see is known as hybrid fiber coaxial, or HFC, which is a broadband network that combines optical fiber and coaxial cable. This is a faster form of wireline connectivity than DSL, but it is not available in all rural environments. Finally, the blue line represents a broadband network that uses optical fiber, which are bundled glass strands that data can be transmitted over. This is the fastest form of wireline connectivity, which is available in urban areas, but is not usually available in any rural environments. So satellites are gaining in their importance as another piece of digital infrastructure, which can provide connectivity to rural and remote areas, specifically in places that do not have connectivity currently. Starlink is by far the largest and most advanced satellite broadband provider, which we'll discuss in this video. So firstly, it's important to understand the different types of satellite deployments because it will help to characterize why Starlink is such a unique endeavor by SpaceX. So first, Geosynchronous Equatorial Orbit, or GEO, satellites. These are on the left side of the video and the farthest away from Earth. Most existing satellite-based internet services use Geosynchronous Equatorial Orbit, which is also known as Geostationary, Geosynchronous, or GSO, but we'll refer to them as GEO satellites for this video. Examples of those satellites are from companies like Dish Network, Echostar, DirecTV, Viasat, Inmarsat, Sirius, and most weather satellites are geosatellites. Geosatellites orbit at approximately 22,000 miles, or 36,000 kilometers, above the Earth and orbit in unison with the Earth's rotation. For context, that distance from a geosatellite to Earth is like driving the historic US Route 66 from Chicago to Los Angeles about nine times. And so as you can see on screen, each satellite is dedicated to cover a fixed area of the globe. So let's run through a few metrics of geosatellites. So first is latency, and given the meaningful distance from Earth, the speed and latency for broadband connectivity on geosatellites suffers, with latency of approximately 700 milliseconds. In terms of network size, because of the distance and geosynchronous orbit, a geo provider can cover the entire globe with only three satellites in orbit and have 99% coverage. Next is data gateways, and these are also known as ground stations, and they are specialized satellite stations that are located on Earth and used to telecommunicate with satellites. In GEO, only a few of the gateways are needed on Earth in order for it to function. In terms of technology readiness level, GEO is a more proven and deployable technology than some of the other standards. The cost to deploy a geo network is the least expensive way amongst the three types, 
and to deploy a satellite broadband network, it is estimated to cost between $1 billion and $1.5 billion. And the satellites in a geosystem last the longest amount of time in space and need to be replaced only every 15 years. So moving to the middle of the diagram to what are known as medium Earth orbit or MEO satellites. MEO is the region of space around Earth that is above low Earth orbit and below geostationary orbit. MEO satellites orbit at about 5,000 miles or 8,000 kilometers above Earth. In MEO, the latency is approximately 150 milliseconds, and the network size for MEO providers allows them to cover the entire globe with six satellites in orbit and have 96% coverage. In terms of data gateways, which are also known as ground stations, in MEO, several gateways are needed on Earth in order for it to function. From a technology readiness level, MEO is a more proven and deployable technology than LEO, for example. In terms of cost to deploy the network, MEO is in the middle in terms of its cost to deploy the satellite broadband network with an estimated cost of $1.5 billion. And MEO satellites need to be replaced approximately every 12 years. Finally, let's move to low Earth orbit, which are LEO satellites, also known as non-geostationary or NGSO satellites. And they're shown on the rightmost part of the video, closest to Earth. And so Starlink offers Low Earth Orbit, or LEO, satellite-based internet services. LEO satellites are small, inexpensive satellites orbiting at levels very close to Earth, approximately 620 miles above Earth. For context, this is the equivalent of driving from Chicago to Atlanta. Additionally, what are known as Very Low Earth Orbit, or VLEO, satellites are orbiting at just over 200 miles above Earth. So they're barely in space and scraping the upper atmosphere. VLEO satellites are orbiting at the equivalent of driving from Chicago to Indianapolis, Indiana. LEO deployments are made up of a large number of satellites, which are known as a constellation. LEO satellites can orbit the globe very fast, completing a full Earth orbit in under one hour. So let's focus in on low Earth orbit LEO satellites, which is what Starlink is. So LEO's close distance to Earth and the sheer number of satellites in its constellation can provide a far better broadband solution in terms of speed and low latency. Latency in LEO is approximately 50 milliseconds, which is very low. But the network size is the downside, and that is you need thousands of satellites for 100% coverage of the globe. Additionally, those data gateways, which are also known as ground stations that we talked about, those specialized satellite stations that are located on Earth and used to telecommunicate with satellites, in LEO, a significant number of the gateways are needed on Earth in order to allow the system to function. And in terms of technology readiness level, technology is still in its development for satellite internet with LEO, with Starlink being the clear leader. In terms of cost to deploy the network, LEO is the most expensive way to deploy a satellite broadband network, with an estimated cost between $5 billion to $15 billion. And both Starlink and Project Kuiper by Amazon have quoted about $10 billion to build their network. The money that goes into this is related to rocket launch costs, which have been expensive and take a significant amount of time. And thinking about it, because more satellites are needed for LEO, significantly more rocket launches take place, as compared to GEO and MEO satellites, which need only three to six satellites to cover the globe for their coverage. In LEO, the satellites last the shortest amount of time in space and need to be replaced every five to seven years. This is because LEO satellites scrape the atmosphere and eventually deorbit back to Earth. Therefore, a LEO constellation will need constant replenishing of new satellites. So let's discuss five active global satellite initiatives, which include Starlink by SpaceX, Project Kuiper by Amazon, and OneWeb, which is backed by the government of the United Kingdom and Bardi Enterprises. These satellite deployments really demonstrate the ambitions of billionaires Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos in space. 
For context, there are only approximately 3,000 operational satellites in space today, and only approximately 9,000 of total satellites have been launched in human history. So the ambitions that you can see with Starlink at nearly 12,000 satellites is incredible. So first, Starlink is SpaceX's satellite-based broadband service and is by far the largest and most advanced satellite broadband provider. Separately, SpaceX is investing in rocket technology to do things like colonize Mars in order for humanity to ensure long-term survival by becoming a multi-planet species. But let's focus on Starlink and its potential. So Starlink's current plan is to have 11,943 satellites in a constellation built over the next six to seven years. These satellites have been approved by the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, and to do this, Starlink will invest about $10 billion into this satellite broadband initiative. Long term, Starlink is also seeking to deploy in aggregate a 42,000 satellite constellation. Starlink will use next generation satellites with additional throughput and lower latency, think less than 20 milliseconds. And to do this, SpaceX filed an application with the International Telecommunications Union to arrange spectrum for 30,000 additional Starlink satellites to go along with its approximately 12,000 that it already has approval for, thus 42,000 in total. Starlink will use the frequency bands KA, KU, and V in order to provide communications across its network. The altitude for Starlink is 550 kilometers above the Earth. And Starlink's main purpose is to provide high-speed, low-latency broadband connectivity across the globe. And we'll get into the specifics of this very shortly. Next is Amazon's Project Kuiper, which is planning to be the second largest low Earth orbit, or LEO, satellite internet service provider behind Starlink. Amazon also owns rocket launch company Blue Origin, which is still approximately five to 10 years behind SpaceX in terms of rocket technology. Separately, Blue Origin has the goal of moving heavy industry off Earth and into space. But focusing on Amazon's Project Kuiper, it has the potential to launch a 3,236 satellite constellation. Amazon will deploy the satellites in five phases, with broadband service beginning once it has 578 satellites in orbit. Amazon will invest more than $10 billion into Project Kuiper. Similar to Starlink, Project Kuiper will use the KA and KU frequency bands and will operate at an altitude of 590 kilometers to 630 kilometers above the Earth. Finally, the purpose of Project Kuiper is that there are too many places where broadband access is unreliable or where it does not exist at all, and Project Kuiper intends to change that. A few other notable satellite broadband initiatives include ones by Boeing, which has the potential for a 3016 satellite constellation using the KA and V bands. Another is OneWeb, which is backed by the government of the United Kingdom and Barty Enterprise after it had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in March of 2020. OneWeb was formerly owned by SoftBank and OneWeb currently has the potential to have a 648 satellite constellation using the KU frequency band. And finally, Telesat, which has the potential to have a 292 satellite constellation using the KA frequency band. So now let's dive a little deeper into Starlink. Starlink will provide high-speed, low-latency broadband connectivity across the globe for homes and businesses. This includes to locations where traditionally internet has been too expensive, unreliable, or entirely unavailable. Specifically, Starlink offers low Earth orbit, or LEO, satellite-based internet services. Starlink's target is rural or semi-rural areas, basically places that do not have connectivity right now. And Starlink estimates that it will be able to serve approximately 5% of the people in the world. So it's really not ideal for high density cities, which are better served by cable and fiber broadband connectivity. Starlink's goal is to rather serve the 4 billion underserved or poorly served people globally with no access to broadband internet. 
and Starlink wants to expand broadband availability to areas where deploying traditional fixed services, meaning by wire, is not economically feasible. Importantly, Starlink's public beta trial launched in October 2020, which we'll actually discuss in the next video of this series. So hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, then please share it with somebody you think might also find it helpful. Also, be sure to check out part two of this two-part series, which is coming out tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. In that video, I'm gonna give you an overview of Starlink's deployments to date, as well as its launch plan for the future, explain how Starlink works, discuss what Starlink can offer you in terms of speed, latency, and capacity, and finally show you how it all ties back to digital infrastructure. With that, please consider subscribing to DGTL Infra and visit us at dgtlinfra.com for more of the latest news on digital infrastructure. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like the video and post in the comments telling me what aspect about Starlink makes you most excited. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video.